Hey everybody, today is Monday, June 22nd, 2020. My name is Matt Fury and you are listening to The Rough Cut. All right, hello once again, my friends. Welcome to our weekly exploration on the world of post-production. Today, as always, should be a lot of fun. For this week, we are not talking about a specific movie or show. We're talking about a lot of movies and shows. In fact, in a way, we're talking about every movie and show because we are talking about visual effects editing. VFX editing is not just the domain of blockbuster, sci-fi, and action movies. No, visual effects are a part of just about every kind of production. And if you're going to have VFX and even the most basic narrative type story, well, then you're going to need to have some really talented artists to edit those effects and manage their life cycle through the post process. I could try to explain it all, but the truth is I never knew that much about it myself, which is why this podcast is long overdue. Who knows? Maybe you're a little mystified by the role of the visual effects editor as well. That's okay. I have some good news for you. For today's podcast, I've assembled an incredibly accomplished, not to mention fun, panel of experts from the world of visual effects editing. The first voice you'll hear on the podcast is that of Winton Payne. Winton has done assistant editing, editing, and of course, visual effects editing. A brief tour of his IMDb page will reveal his VFX work on shows such as Siren, Iron Fist, and Luke Cage, as well as the new Space Jam movie, Space Jam, A New Legacy. Also joining Winton today is Sharon smith Holly, who has a considerable roster of VFX editing gigs. Uh, so just to name a few, How about Too Fast, Too Furious, Agent Carter, The Expendables, Men in Black 3, Alita Battle Angel, Gemini Man, and the upcoming movie Unhinged, which may be one of the first movies back in the theater soon. We'll have to see. And finally, rounding out our roster for today, my old friend Marty Cloner. Marty was one of the first people I reached out to to offer up my confession that I really don't understand visual effects editing. You have seen Marty's work on such films as Mission Impossible 3, Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and Star Wars, both The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker. So, quite a lineup of heavy hitters on the show today, and that's what we do here on The Rough Cut. We go to the best of the best, and we learn what we can. So let's not wait another minute. Here are Winton, Sharon, and Marty to teach us about the art and science of VFX editing. I about doing this interview, this session, um, for the very same reason for both. That's because... After all this time, all these years, I still feel like I don't know much about VFX editing. And I thought it's time to face it head on. And, you know, who better to tackle it with than the three of you? So I'm sure there's going to be times where you think, hey, boy, he should really know this, shouldn't he? But I feel somewhat better in that in doing a little research on this prior to our discussion, a lot of the information I found online was contradictory or just I kind of knew had to be wrong. So maybe it's not just me. Maybe visual effects editing is something that a lot of people don't quite understand or have misconceptions about. So before we try and break all that down and and teach me a thing or two, one thing I did notice was that amongst the three of you, there was a start with assistant editing, so that you were doing some assistant editing at some point. And then it seems like people veer off from assistant editing into visual effects editing and then either decide to build a nice career on that or to keep one foot in picture editing and the other in VFX. So I thought what we would do is to go around the room, or at least the room on my screen here, and just find out from each of you how you got your start in specifically visual effects editing. So, Winton Payne, Mm -hmm. uh, you drew the short straw. You come up first (laughs) on my my screen (laughs) clockwise. So, tell me a little bit about how you first got into visual effects editing. Well, um, it wasn't very direct. Um, I've always been in love with visual effects, you know, ever since I was young, watching you know, things like Ghostbusters and, you know, anything that had like the very crazy, you know, visual effects. Um, but I started off as an artist, really, as a comp artist, as a 3D modeler and, and animator. And, um, you know, one day I, I was, you know, in the, the throes of compositing and I'm like, I really love this, but I wasn't getting something out of it. And um, I was like, what, what, what else can I do? And I, I'd also taught uh, uh, software, After Effects, uh, Final Cut Pro and, and whatnot. And my wife was like, well, you love editing. You've done promos and things like that. Um, why don't you just do that? You can do it for hours without doing anything else. So I was like, 
Yeah, that makes sense. So I started doing more research into that. Um, and, you know, I ended up meeting a really good uh, friend who was in the industry, uh, Robert Grasmere, who's a visual effects supervisor. And um, he did he worked on Salt and he's also a really good director. And, um, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I started getting actually started with a little bit of assisting, but I started editing quite quickly uh, and um, also did some, you know, some shorts for some friends, but I fell in love with editing first and, you know, telling the story. And then um, on, uh, you know, I, I had already done a lot of compositing and, you know, word got around and someone was like, you know, there's this, there's this director who, who really needs a compositor. And I was like, you know what, I'm really trying not to do that uh, anymore, uh, for a little while. And, you know, I ended up doing it for, uh, this film for a really good friend, Charles Murray, who's also a really talented, uh, writer and director. And, you know, we almost, we almost did not even like connect like the first, I'd say 10 or 15 minutes was the most contentious for almost no reason, just because of how we got connected. And then we kept talking and it was our love of comic books and Marvel that really got us to like really get in sync. So anyway, moving past that, like we had a really good time on, on the movie that we did together. And, um, a few months later, you know, he mentioned, uh, that, you know, he might be, he might have a, you know, an in for me somewhere. And I was like, oh, okay, what, you know, what's that? And then I get a, a call um, to come in and interview for Luke Cage as a uh, visual effects editor. And I had never, like, I'd heard of it, but I had never done it before, you know? So I was like, yeah, sure, I guess, you know, I, I'm an artist and I'm an editor, so maybe I can do both. And um, I went in, got the interview um, and uh, hit it off. And that's, that, that was really like my first uh, visual effects editing gig. And I, it's, it's funny, like even with the, the, even the small experience that I have, I feel like I'm still learning a lot about it and what it is. It's still kind of growing. Well, good. That makes me feel a little bit better that even you're still learning. <laughs> um, and you're already challenging some, some thoughts that I had. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. interesting that you, you started off doing, I always felt like it was, it was truly editing first. And then you found your way into compositing and effects like that. And, and it's interesting to hear you say that you, you had some experience and a passion for that even prior. Um, Sharon, how about yourself? I actually started in production and got into editing because I was too shy to keep looking for a job every three months and was a first assistant editor for several years and a uh, editor that I worked with went on to another project and so when we finished the film I was working on with him I stayed and finished that one then I went on to the new film I went on as a assistant to the second editor and there was not visual effects, so to speak, in this movie, but it really turned out that there were. It was a, dr a drama, a period piece about Ty Cobb, and they needed a lot of um, flashback of, hit, of uh, Tommy Lee Jones flashbacking, and so there was different levels of desaturation that needed to be done, and um, they, they shot in Tahoe, and they needed to add snow, and um, there was no visual effects supervisor, producer, or anything like that, so the producer took me to go meet Cinecite, met them and um, started dealing with them directly. And the producer took me back to the cutting room and he said, okay, so you're in charge and if you have any questions, you just contact me. So I ended up having to deal with the budgets and the schedules and approving shots, dealing with assets and elements. And um, this was, you know, back when we were doing a lot of opticals, there, there wasn't this whole digital um, visual effects house type thing. Um, and went took the director to look at wedges for color timing, and I even got to draw. Um, when he's honored at the Baseball Hall of Fame, there's like a newsreel that's supposed to be his life, and so I drew like what the logo should look like, and the director liked it, uh, Ron Shelton, and he had Pac Tyler reproduce it. So I found it to be really creative on that first job because not only was I able to use my art design love but um also just getting to deal with so many different aspects and and not be on the editor's schedule sort of dealing with you know working my own day-to-day -day schedule and it gave me a lot of independence 
So from that experience, um, I continued on where I would start a film as the first assistant, and then as soon as we got through dailies and it was time to start working with uh, visual effects, um, I would move over and become the visual effects editor, and the second would be bumped up. And it allowed me to know where the bones were buried and um, be very familiar with the project because I started the show from the very beginning and was on location and all that. And at the end of that film, I got a bonus check for a whole week's salary as thank you for, um, and I mean, that's sort of, I don't know many people who get bonus checks um, at the end of a show, but I, they said I was planning to go to Europe for the first time and they're like, use this money for your trip, do not use it for bills, but we wanna give you a bonus check for um, you know handling all the visual effects and what do you want your credit to be? And there weren't a lot of visual effects editors back then, this was like 1993, 94. And um, just sort of fell in love with the uh, with the jobs, that, with the duties that visual effects editing entailed, which was you know going through the cut and doing counts when we had to do them on optical uh, sheets, and and um, uh, you know be, you're part librarian, part detective. Uh, you deal with the visual effects house and. Um, and I really love doing that. Well, Marty, you are the man of the hour because it's your turn to tell us uh, how you got your start in visual effects editing. Uh, I don't remember. No. Um, <laughs> it was that long ago? It was that long ago. You know, I was an assistant and I was a first assistant and then I became an avid first assistant in a cutting room where there was an avid first and a film first. And the thing that I had the most fun doing was sound effects because it was the most creative thing I could do as an assistant editor at the time. And I started to play around with the avid effects and I was on a show called vertical limit in 1999. And I had also created a code book using FileMaker pro and the visual effects team was impressed with the FileMaker database because they also used FileMaker. And we were in New Zealand and the VFX supervisor at the time, Kent Houston, said to the studio, you know, I don't want to bring in another visual effects editor. I want you to bump him up to visual effects. And from that point on, it's been all visual effects. And, you know, the visual effects has replaced the sound effects for me. And um, it's a lot of fun to, you know, come up with a comp I always say that I'm the world's best hack because, you know, <laughs> the only thing I need to come up with is something good enough for a screening. And it has caused many problems with visual effects vendors saying, well, we can't do that. And of course they can, but that's how I got into VFX editing. Been doing it ever since. Well, it seems to be working for you. Well, this is a good place to try and figure out the nuts and bolts of visual effects editing. And the first place that I would like to start literally is where do you guys start? Where, or I guess I should say when, does the function of a visual effects editor begin on a film and end? Because I know with picture editing, it's very early. But with visual effects editing, I'm completely in the dark as to where you begin. So, Marty, why don't we work backwards? We'll start with you this time. Well, you know, I've, I've been on most of the shows I've been on, I come on at the beginning of production. And, you know, you, you can look at the footage, look to see what you have to, to make comps with, to organize all that footage, get your database in order for that particular film because things change on every movie from one to the next and you gotta take your database and adjust it for that movie. But I've also been on plenty of shows where I'm not brought on until the film goes into post, which I don't really like because either you're inheriting it from another visual effects editor who was the visual effects editor on location and you have to live with their system of organization or convert everything over to the way you like the workflow to run. And also you don't know anything about the footage if you come on after it's already been shot. You're playing catch up a lot. So Wynton, I'm probably gonna do this a lot throughout our discussion, mm -hmm. but because of your experience in, and I'll use the generic term television, is that in television, do you find that your experience is different than working in film or is that pretty much the same kind of thing? 
It's kind of the same thing. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with a company like Marvel where I can sort of roll over from show to show. So I'll often start the conversation before that show begins, um, but then I'll fully come on like maybe the first or second um, week after shooting has started. Um, but I'm already preparing for that show, you know, with my database and presets and that sort of thing. But yeah, that's, a, that's about right. I prefer to come on as early as I can, you know, to start talking with the editors, the directors, um, if I can, if I'm afforded to, uh, just to understand the story and what they're going for. So that way I know when I'm going through and marking up shots, I just sort of have an idea of what they might flag or what they might be looking for. So Sharon, when, when Marty started talking about possibly picking up work from a VFX editor that was on set, that sort of naturally leads me into like, well, who are the different role players within visual effects editing? And why would there be somebody that would be on set as opposed to just in post? How does that play out? Well, he might have been talking about them having somebody on location and then they bring it back to Los Angeles. That's happened to me where I will go on to a show and be on location. And if they decide to finish it up in New York, there will be a couple weeks overlap where we will pass off all the information and database and everything to the person who's going to stay on in New York because they don't want to pay for my housing. But yet I was in Budapest and Savannah and all the other places. However, um, on uh, one particular film, I, I was on set because we were doing mocap and they um, and we were in Budapest and it was really helpful you know, you spend a month prepping sequences for them to have as reference for all the different monitors on a mocap stage, but to be actually have a little area on set with your avid. And of course, they tint it all up so that other people don't wander over and see the editor's cut, except for, you know, the lead actor who's doing the mocap or the stunt guys uh, when you play it for them. So um, to actually be on set, I think is pretty rare in my um, experience, but such a wonderful change of pace. But definitely you, I always take my job as being that I want everyone to know what I'm doing so that if, you know, I always say if I'm hitting it by a car tomorrow and I'm not here, I know I've done my job successfully if everybody, you know, can pick up without me being around and know what's been turned over and um, any mix downs I've had to use, they can actually match it back and see what the original shots were. And for that reason, I try not to use like After Effects. I do everything I can using Avid uh, effects because I've gone on two shows where there was a visual effects editor and we didn't have an overlap. And I spent time trying to figure out where he got an element. And then finally I called him and he's like, oh, I got that off the internet. And I'm like, oh, I've been looking through dailies forever for that shot in the sky. And so to me, it's like, you know, I, I felt this way when I was a first assistant to tell everybody what was going on, even the PA, just so that we could work together as a team and that the show could run smoothly. So whether or not you're picking up somebody else's work from the set, you know, somebody was doing VFX editing on set and then you picked it up in post. On location, yeah. On, like, on location, yes, thank you. Certainly on films, on television shows, there, are, there can be multiple editors. Can there be multiple visual effects editors working in parallel on a, on a project? Yeah, it depends how, um, how high visual effects. I, when I worked on a Marvel uh, TV show, I was the only one and I was dealing with all episodes with all editors and their different ways of having their projects set up, um, which is challenging. But I do know some people who have been on um, really, um, you know, like Lost in Space, there were more than one visual effects editor or there was at least assistant visual effects editors working with a visual effects editor. How have you found that, Winton? I've typically been the only visual effects editor. It's only recently that I've I've had co-editors and um, I've never had an assistant. So I've, I've had to run my own shows. But luckily, um, you know, again, with working with Marvel, we were close in close proximity with other shows. So if I need to bounce something off of someone else, that show had its own visual effects editor. So we could talk and share uh, information. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting because yeah, I talked about the division comparing and contrasting film and television, but regardless of whether it's film or TV, more to the point, depending on how big the budget is, are there certain roles or functions that can be eliminated or added? You know, for example, in a smaller budget project, would any of you also function as the previs artist or editor or concept artist? Things I'm not even really clear about what they are yet. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like we, and you guys can 
you know, agree. Um, but I've always done temp work um, and been sort of a, a post-viz, pre-viz person where we'll, in order to get an editor's or directors or producers idea across, they're like, hey, can you throw this comp together, you know, and see if you can come up with something that we can send to the vendors. And um, that way we don't have to do too much work in trying to explain what it's going to look like. Yeah, I mean, definitely having temp work in, in a cut. Uh, uh, my last film, I was mortified when they said that they were going to use all my temp comps in a preview. I was like on a big screen, but they thought they were good enough. And I was like, so surprised, but, you know, happy. But for previews, that's why you should have a visual effects editor on at the start, because, you know, sometimes the third floor, someone will do a previs sequence and send it to the editor, but the editor also wants each of those shots so that he can change the sequence. And then you can start assigning shot names to the previs from a vendor that does the previs. There's, um, you know, post viz, which would be something where you would send a sequence to a post house and, and then you tell them, what you need them to do, a visual effects house, I mean, to do um, those shots so that they can be cut in during post. But I actually had stunt viz on a show where the stunt crew would go and they'd choreograph a shot, they'd shoot it, they'd edit it, which freaked me out because I was like, where's this stuff coming from? <laughs> and then they would give it to me and I would have to go and put shot names on them and compare it to what was in the breakdowns from the visual effects producer so that they knew how many more shots that the um, stunt people were suggesting so that when the director saw the sequence and approved the choreography of the fights, um, this is Gemini Man, where there was a lot of fighting between Will Smith and Will Smith, so it all had to be very thought out beforehand. So there was a lot of all these other vizs that are now coming up between pre-viz, post-viz, stunt viz, you know. It's just basically pre-planning the scene before it's shot or adding to the scene after it's shot. But you even get storyboards. On my last show, I was getting storyboards and they wanted me to cut them together. And I was like, you know, this is really, you know, you don't want to step on any toes. This is really what an editor needs to make these decisions, how he wants these storyboards to go into his existing cut. So I'm sure that Marty has experience with so many different other new ways that they're doing things. Well, you know, it depends on who you work with and, you know, what, company you're working with and what importance the visual effects are to the show. When I did my one Marvel show, visual effects was everything that came first, but I still, you know, when Marvel wanted a sequence as a quick time, I still run it by the editor to make sure it was okay with them. But ultimately Marvel gets what Marvel wants. And when just going back to the question you asked earlier, Matt, about visual effects editors, that's the only show I've been on where there were four visual effects editors. Oh my gosh. Wow. And on their movies, that's sort of how they run them. They don't have assistant visual effects editors. Everybody's, you're either a visual effects editor or you're not. And the other thing is they have so many vendors on those shows sometimes when they have 2,300 shots that the way they like to work it is that each visual effects editor is responsible for a vendor, which isn't my favorite way of running a show because when visual effects editor goes down, you don't know what's going on with that vendor anymore. On our show, most of the reason we had four visual effects editors was because the way they wanted to run reviews, the way the supervisor and the VFX producer wanted to run reviews was so complicated and it involved the avid that two visual effects editors all day long, every day, prepared for those reviews, while the other two of us did everything else. Wow. In a scenario like that, where each visual effects editor is assigned to a vendor, in other words, a company that does the actual effects, I would assume that each of those vendors would specialize in certain types of effects, and that that means that visual effects editor is only working on one type of effect. Is that the case, or is it no? They, these different vendors could all do the same thing. You know, sometimes there are vendors that are that specialize in things like Lola specializes in cosmetic cosmetic effects. <laughs> yeah, and um, you're not supposed to. I mean, it used to be that you weren't even supposed to say when a shot went to Lola yes. because <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> Look in the credits. <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, I think you know the visual the vendors pretty much do the same. I mean, certainly some of them are better than others, so they get. You know, some vendors will get the smaller shots and other vendors will get the more complicated shots. I found a lot 
that it it's divided up by sequence sometimes like this vendor gets this sequence this vendor gets this sequence and certainly they want to use the vendors for whatever their strong suit is yeah they also bid against each other too so you know and and then workload maybe one vendor can't do everything I've had shows where uh, one vendor will do all the temp visual effects to get it out for a preview, and then another vendor would do the final, which always seemed sort of um, not really fiscally responsible, or I don't know. You know? How, or mm-hmm. how about this? When one vendor is responsible for the shots, but they have another vendor do them for them. Oh, yeah. I have not come against that one. So sort of like subcontracting. Subcontracting, yeah. 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 Or a vendor, one vendor does one part of it, might do the 3D work, and another vendor does the smoke and the atmosphere, and they have to, you know, get the assets from each other. That's always always fun to keep track of. Yeah. Well, when you have, when you're on a show, um, you know, when I did Spiderwick Chronicles, you know, one show was responsible for certain CG characters and another vendor was responsible for other CG characters. Oh, wow. And so when they were both in a shot together, both vendors had to work on the shot. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I've also had it a lot where, you know, you have a vendor that's supposed to do a certain kind of effect, like CG characters or elements, and they just get overloaded, right? Either they have other shows that they have to work on and deal with. And so they'll have to share those assets with other vendors. And then we'll have those new vendors take over. Um, and then there becomes like a budgeting issue. One vendor might be more expensive than the other, and that becomes its own thing. Mm. So now that we're getting into sort of the mechanics and the processes involved, something we shouldn't skip over is the hierarchy, I guess, for lack of a better term. You know, films are broken down or television shows are broken down into departments. Technically, what department does VFX editing fall into and or does it have its own <laughs> sub department? Sharon, Marty, Winton, whoever wants to jump on that, go for it. It's, it's funny because sometimes I'm in the budget of editorial and sometimes I'm in the budget of visual effects. And yeah. uh, I was on a show where the visual effects um, producer wanted me on the show and the editor knew me and it was fine, but the editor wanted me in his budget. So then when he got let go, the visual effects producer couldn't like fight to keep me. So, um, which is, you know, it's things like that happen all the time with people above us being let go and stuff like that. But I prefer to be in editorial and um, because you know ultimately to me I'm going to get the cut from the editor and I want him to know what I'm turning over and make sure that he's not still working on that scene so I I was you know recently asked like where do you want your credit to be in the end credits do you want it to be with editorial visual effects and I would rather be with editorial than visual effects. Well, there's less mm-hmm. people in editorial than visual effects too. <laughs> and also there's vendors that will have a visual effects editor on. So, you know, they should yeah, have their exactly. spot. I think that part of part of the way Sh- Sharon feels is because both of us came up as assistants in the cutting room. Yeah. And my first loyalty on a show is always to the editor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like it has to be, it has to be, you know, it's really interesting because I think us more than anybody else in the cutting room, we're, you know, we're, we're standing in two different departments and we have to make them both happy. And there are times when those two departments are not happy with each other (laughs) and it rolls right down to us. Uh And, and even though both departments know it's not the visual effects editors fault or responsibility, it doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sometimes, Thank you. you know, it, we're straddling that line and it can be difficult sometimes because mm-hmm. we do have to make them both happy regardless of whose budget our salary comes out of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I would rather the editor have to talk to the studio about um, whether a scene should be a certain way for the director, for the producers than, than me. So that's why I always prefer to have the editor be um, the person that I go to for you know, what is the the act of cut? But, you know, we have so many bosses as a visual effects editor. We have the post-production supervisor who's going to approve our overtime. We have the visual effects producer, the visual effects supervisor, the editor, things the first assistant needs, things that marketing needs. Um, you know, sometimes I think maybe it was easier being a first assistant editor because your only boss really was your um, editor and your post-supervisor. Yeah, I've always felt that we were... Uh, editor. I've always been editorial and I felt closest to the editors because of that, but also having 
come from editing and understanding just how you know close we are in in terms of uh you know the technical aspect like you were saying sharing that you know we're like our work is directly given to the editor and based off of like the timeline and everything so i kind of prefer that a lot but i've i haven't had a lot of uh times where i'm like specifically uh vfx you know you know our jobs i think are much more creative when most of our instruction is coming from the editor because they want us to fix problems. I mean, a lot of what I do now is take footage that they shot to work a certain way, but that's not how they want it to work. They want to manipulate it to work a different way. And I don't know about you guys, Sharon, Winton, if you've hmm. ever had the situation where, you know, you do a comp and the director falls in love with it, but the vendor doesn't want to do it. Yeah. All the time. I mean, the, the, the biggest compliment, I think, being a visual effects editor is when you somehow affected the actual outcome, the final outcome of a visual effects shot for the better. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've had many times where I, I'll do a comp and they will love it so much. And the vendor comes back with something and uh, the producers and the editors, they're like, eh, uh, how, you know what, let's just give them your work files and then they can work on top of that. And then I feel really bad because, you know, it's like you're hired to do this job and now you're taking my temp work to present it as your own. Mm. Is that common? It's been more common than I like to admit. I had that too on one show, you know, where the, the vendor kept coming back with something and the producer on the show, not the VFX producer, but the actual producer kept saying, no, do it like he did it. Hmm. And, you know, you just lower your head and don't want to look anybody in the eyes. And I mean, we're trying to do what's best for the movie. So. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what's important, you know, and yeah. we're, we're just trying to get to what that end result is supposed to look like. And we're all artists, you know, it's, you know, one person isn't better than the other one. One department isn't, at least that's, you know, how I like to work. So. You know, I'm flattered, but at the same time, I'm like, eh, cringe sometimes, you know. <laughs> well, that, I thought it's fascinating to hear you say, Marty, about, um, you know, the director wanted one thing and the vendor had a different idea. Aren't they there to serve just like the editor, just like the visual effects, to serve the vision of the director? Well, yes, but I, in the case that I'm talking about, the, the VFX supervisor on our show came from this vendor originally and he had this idea of what he wanted to do and I, the producer just didn't like everything that they came back with because they were trying to and rightly so they were trying to improve on what i hacked together um but I, he i don't know he just they fell in love with what i did or i don't they just hated what the vendor was doing, I don't know what it was, but because that VFX supervisor was originally from that, that house, he kept pushing their ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm sure VFX editing is not immune to politics, just like every other department in, in filmmaking. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I think I want to start with, with TV on this next question, but I do think it applies to everything. And that is this trend in recent years, um, maybe mostly to do with the quality of the tools that are available immediately to you. Uh, but that trend to deliver a more finished quality experience in offline, uh, I think that largely manifested itself in audio first. Seeing people do surround or 5.1, now even 7.1 audio in picture editorial. Um, but what about visual effects? Are there, do you, you know, Winton, again, I'll start with you because television is another perfect example of being asked to do more faster with less and at a higher quality than ever before. Is that something that you felt in recent years and how have you been able to deal with that? Yeah, um, I think it's it's a great deal to do with, you know, the tools giving us more options and being able to get things out quicker, like just doing, you know, a simple composite is a lot easier now than what it was, you know, a long time ago. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely finding it's like, yeah, can we have this 3D tracking shot where, you know, this, this plane is coming in or this other thing is happening um, and they'll ask, I mean, the most we could say is, uh, I could try and, you know, throw something yeah. together. 
And if it comes out, great. And, that, you know, they've been more, you know, the shows I've been on, they've been very receptive of, hey, if you tried and it's not perfect or it looks terrible, we just won't use it. You know, we just say that you couldn't do it. Um, but, that, but, but that is the best thing to say is, <laughs> yeah, I can try. I could, that's the best. It's, it's the catch all, you know, so that, you know, if you fall flat on your face, it's, it's no pressure, you know, and that's part of the, I think you were saying it uh, earlier, uh, Marty, just that, you know, there's no there's no pressure you know, uh, or there's not as much pressure, uh, really, to finish the shot and have like this polished thing that looks absolutely beautiful. You know, uh, I think the pressure only really comes on when you do something that's really, really, really good looking, and they're like, "Oh, can you do that again and again mm -hmm. and again and again?" Um, but just just to answer the question, how I usually deal with it is, I'm, you know, I, I used to be an artist, you know, once upon a time anyway, so I'm also you know, I'm on myself very hard to try to do better and better. And I typically just, you know, throw those skills in there. And they, they I haven't really had many, uh, much pushback, you know, um, because I'll use things like Cinema 4D or After Effects or whatever to get those shots that I, I just need that extra bit of, um, you know, that thing uh, to bring into the shot. So going back to... Um working with the director that was something i was a little unclear about going into this and that was do you and i'm sure it, it maybe it's dependent on the show or on the director um whoever he or she may be do you interface directly with the director or is it always you go through the picture editor definitely depends on the show yeah i've always i've been on shows where i was able to interface with the director but i um typically are on shows where i'm like the only visual effects editor and they're not you know mm -hmm. too huge so but it, I've done both. Yeah. Do you have a preference? I mean, again, maybe it's dependent on who that director is, but is there, is, is it easier for you just to have that one other person to work directly with, in this case, the editor, or do you like having a lot of input and, you know, direction from somebody else? It depends on what you're asked to do. You know, if it's, if it's a fix that the editor's trying to get you to do to make the cut work, then it's great, you know, that it's just the editor you have to worry about. But I found particularly working with JJ, I really appreciate the fact that if I have a question about a shot, I can go right to him and ask him. And you know, what he says goes. And it's so much better that way than having to go through a director's assistant or something like that, mm -hmm. and you end up getting the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would go to the director if he said something in a review that he wanted changed, I could go to him for clarification or um, you know, if he wanted a different asset used and, um, you know, we would go and look and research something for the temp, something like that. But I mean, I wouldn't do it to not go through the editor. It would be to more, get more information. I would feel comfortable going to the director. Oh, and I'm not saying that I would do it to avoid the editor. Oh, no, either. I know you weren't saying that. Definitely. But yeah. It's good that you can go to both of them at the same time. Exactly. That's sure. what I meant. Yeah. 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 So when they're, when that editor's asking for fixes, Marty, I, I just can't let that one go. And this is, again, for all of you, give me some examples of the types of fixes you're being asked. And I, it's probably a, a, it's a big question, but the type of fixes you're being asked to do to, to, to solve a problem with an edit. Well, in the last Star Wars movie, um, there was a shot of Rey when she was facing Palpatine at the end. And they wanted her to be strong. But one of the best takes had a tear rolling down her cheek. And JJ said, can you get rid of that tear? And I said, I could try. <laughs> and I just used an alternate take. I took her cheek from an alternate take that had a similar move because it had a big camera move on it too. And, you know, luckily it worked, you know, and, you know, 50% of the time it's just luck that it worked. <laughs> And, you know, it blew him away because he completely got rid of the tear, but it wouldn't have worked in the cut if she had this one tear rolling down her face on one cut and then didn't have it in the next cut. Right. Wow. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Sharon, um, hearing that example from Marty, that almost sounded to me like I, I could picture certain editors trying that themselves. Are there editors that will try and do a little VFX editing themselves or is there... Is there a clear delineation between, okay, that's picture editing and this is visual effects editing? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I worked on a show with an editor who was 
sort of old school and he, he, you know, didn't really um, want to spend time doing that stuff. But then I've also worked with other editors who will um, love to do their own stuff. Um, I mean, it depends what they have time for, too. Sometimes it's like they'll put a locator and they'll say, can you get rid of this or put this image inside this monitor? We had a lot of monitors and cell phones and stuff like that that I had to do. So, you know, it, it really depends on the editor and their schedule, how much time they had. You know, the, the first editor I was talking about, he was in a crunch to get the director's cut done. So um, he didn't really have time to to even think about all that stuff. So I would go through the cut just like a, an assistant would do to fix sound glitches and stuff like that, um, fill the tracks for the sound. I would go through the cut and, and see what had blue screen and all that and just work behind the editor to, to get that stuff done. You know, there are other shows I've worked on where the editor and the first assistant were in another country and the first assistant was right there with the editor. So he would do all the temps but meanwhile, it was good because I was so busy working with the visual effects supervisor and producer and coordinators on all the prep stuff for shooting that I wouldn't have, you know, had time to do a temp, send it back to the editor, see if it's what he wanted and all that stuff like that. So um, I think it really depends. Uh, a lot of editors want to be hands on everything and some just want to work with the director and, and the pacing and the storytelling. The Marvel show that I was on we had a post team working with us in the same building. Nice. Oh, wow. So, so they, the editors would say, I want this shot. And, you know, it could be completely CG. And we went into this room of nine guys sitting in this room. And I'd say, okay, the editor wants something like this. And, you know, a half a day later, I'd have a version of it. So I'm assuming half a day is a ridiculously short amount of time to turn something around. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, especially something that's full CG, you know, um, I, I think it, it just really depends on the editor because some editors don't want to be bothered with it at all. Some of them want to try it a little bit just so that when we see it, we get the idea of what they're trying to do and we just make it better. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. them even having to tell us. It is so great to have previs down the hall for sure. Yeah, it was. Well, and I think most of the Marvel movie, it was the Marvel movie and most of them worked that way. They carry a post viz team with them until they don't need them anymore for screenings. Mm. Yeah, we didn't have that on the show. So. On Too Fast, Too Furious, we had some two people from Pixel Logic uh, down the hall for us, and so I could give them um, something right away, and they could put a CG car in it for a car jumping off. Of, you know, there's a scene where the car jumps over a gap in a bridge, and um, that was pretty cool to get that fast. And I even saw my visual effects supervisor take a still shot of a car that I gave him from Daly's and the background of the people rushing forward. And he put it into his laptop, brought it and showed it to me where he comped the car speeding by and the people rushing up afterward. And we ended up using that and filming it out as the final. And I was just like, wow, you know, the, I mean, Hammerhead was our visual effects vendor at the time and they were doing tons of shots and could have done it, but he was just able to do it like within hours. So I should probably ask just for sheer metrics. First, there was the, wow, having, having um, post viz. I think you said, Marty, you know, on hand, we were able to turn around a, a shot in half a day. Is there a typical, it's a two-parter. Is there a typical amount of turnaround there is? And again, maybe it depends on the type of shot and also how many visual effects shots could there be on a typical blockbuster? Um, well, the last two Star Wars movies that I did, seven and nine, they were pretty close. It was about 1,800. But the Marvel movie I was on, that was a little over 2,300. And the, the show I'm on now, which is nothing compared to those two shows, but it's still 1,400, 1,500 shots. So even like a non sci-fi blockbuster action movie even the most basic narrative story could have a lot of visual effects work that you just don't see yeah because you can fix every you really can fix everything in post <laughs> just about now yeah you know from co cosmetic fixes to uh god knows what camera reflections crews in the shot everything mm -hmm. that yep. they don't want to take time because it's going to cost money in production they uh will just let it be like that in the shot and then you know oh that's going to come out of post-production budget not the you know i worked on a show 
many years ago where they didn't want to wait 15, 20 minutes for the rest of the plane. So they only shot with the cockpit and it was like a $20,000 shot. And I was like, because production didn't want it to come out of their budget that the crew was waiting for them to get that piece over there. Um, so, you know, that, that happens a lot. I mean, I worked on shows where there was, a, you know, obviously a 3D character and uh, a CG character. So there were a lot of shots, but even, you know, a simple show that they don't really have a big budget for visual effects. All of a sudden there's cameras and back of cars and there's the wrong phone numbers on cell phones and... And the actor looks fat. Oh, I'm, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, yes, I mean, you know, yes. I can think of a couple shows in particular that had six or 700 visual effects shots because they had to fix the actor and the actress in, in all the shots. I, I was actually hired on a show to deal with just Lola shots. And there was like four or 500 shots that I had to do. And it had to, everything to do from tattoo removals to the actress looks too thin, the actor looks too heavy. Um, and uh, the visual effects producer and visual effects supervisor were like, they wrung their hands of it. They're like, you know, that's all you share and you deal with all those. And I'm like, okay, because they had enough things that they were dealing with. So you're so right. It's, it's, you could have two people sitting. I always say you could have two people sitting having lunch. At, the whole movie is two people talking, you know, lunch with Andre or something. And all of a sudden they decide that they didn't like the curl, the way the hair was hanging down their forehead. And, and, um, you know, they wanted to change their eyes. At different, I don't know. It's really crazy. The hair is too gray. All the time. The, mm -hmm. Now, did they ask you to do any of the temps yourself? No, not usually. I, I worked on a show. I won't say what show it was, but there was a actress in the movie and she was pregnant, but she neglected to tell anybody she was pregnant. But halfway through the, the shoot, it became pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. And there are 99 shots in this movie that was shot in 3D. And I think it was Lola, where Lola had to make her skinnier in the 99 shots. So when you see the actors hanging around the craft services table, do you sort of go up and say, hey, have you tried the cheesecake? <laughs> <laughs> Job security. <laughs> Seriously. She, this, this particular actress, the producer brought her into my room to show her the comparison oh, between no. the before and after. And she looked at him. She had w just watched the movie. So he brought her in to show her and she looked at me and she said, thank you. Oh. And I said, well, I didn't, I didn't do, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> it's a tough business. And her husband, who is also a famous actor said, now that I know they can do that, I'm going to make them do that in all my movies. <laughs> oh gosh. Now just to sort of round out the whole reflection thing, I worked on the show where it was, it was a boat scene and we're shooting into the boat. Glass is still there and there is a full crew behind the glass reflections and all it's not i mean it's it's very obvious like you see people moving smiling they might as well be waving and there's several several takes of this happening and we're like you know like the reflection is covering our actors faces and and all of that stuff and i looked at it like well i'm not temping this like i have no idea you know what we're gonna do and we, we shipped it off to a company and i mean they did a really good job removing it. i didn't i didn't think it was going to be doable what was the visual effects company that was able to do it? I don't remember. I wonder, was this Encore? We might have shipped it off to Encore, but don't call me on that. What do each of you find is the most misunderstood thing about visual effects editing, whether it's from people outside the business or even, you know, within the filmmaking world? Probably that we do the visual effects. Yeah. Like the actual shots. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I think people don't realize what can be changed in a visual effects shot or improved on. I don't even think that some of the actors in the movie realize how the visual effects helped them. There was a show I worked on where an actor was de-aged for the movie and he claimed in a, an article that 95% of it was done by the makeup artist on set. Wow. And in fairness to him, I don't think anybody ever brought him into the cutting room and said, okay, here's the before and here's the after. I mean, they changed his posture, his hair, everything to make him look a lot younger. And it was definitely not 95% done on the set. 
But it's fascinating how certain departments you wouldn't really think about um, overlapping or blending. Again, because of the technology, it's, it's really starting to do so. It really is. I, you know, I know of a makeup artist who has another business, which is doing these makeup fixes after the fact. Oh, I think we must know the same people. We, <laughs> go figure. I mean, you just don't do the makeup very well, and then you can get extra money in post to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so looking back over um, over your considerable careers, has there been a film or a project or show that you were on where you felt like this was the one that really moved me forward the most? Maybe it's in terms of technique, like you learned something that was just a key part of your arsenal moving forward, or maybe just in your career in general. And when we start with you. Oh, my gosh. Um, I feel like every show is different, and I learned something meaningful from all of them. Um you know, I, I I know that that's kind of a very blanket statement, but I feel like it's it's really true. Um, I you know again I was very blessed with my first uh, visual effects uh, gig starting out in Marvel because of the the way the people in the company, uh, you know, the way we interacted. You know, it it I was very since the beginning I've been very um, welcomed um, to collaborate on the creative part of the process, and so you know that allows me to grow as a creative, you know, and instead of just being someone to say, oh yeah, this shot has a, you know, a rig removal or this shot needs to have, you know, an extra few frames of this, I've been able to um, chime in and say, yeah, you know, maybe we don't need this element in the shot and, you know, let's tone this down um, and and make these kinds of, you know, because of, of this story point, you know? So I'd say, you know, every show that I've been on has, has, grown me in that way i yeah i i love working with different people because you always learn how they like to do things um and when i was growing up as an apprentice the first assistant said learn how i do things and how other people do things and then when you're first then you you know then you can pick the way you want the cutting room to run and i haven't done a lot of shows where there were more visual effects editors, and I really wish that I could get on a show that had multiple visual effects editors so I could see how, you know, um, the, you divide up the work. But I had had an assistant that I had to, um, on one show, that they hired on location, and um, he didn't, had never worked in a feature, and he'd never worked in visual effects before. But um, I was able to, you know, teach him a lot, and through teaching him, it reminded me of, of things that, you know, how I've done it on other shows and how to do it on this show. Um, and, and I do love working with um, different visual effects supervisors because some of them, like I work with Ken Ralston and it was just in, in uh, Jay Red and, and uh, Joyce Cox on Men in Black 3. And the three of them were so, um, just had such a, a, a iconic careers and, and wealth of information and, um, so, yeah, you just just always learn how other people do things and and also, you know, you learn how to do things differently for yourself. You know, Avid keeps changing, too. So you're always trying to keep up on all the great improvements that they do for that, that help visual effects editors. Yeah, the learning never stops. No you know, question. There's always. And, and just because of, you know, working on different shows and new effects are coming out, just you know, like you're, I, f I find like my workflow is always changing and it never is, you know, works for the same, you know, same thing that works for one show doesn't work for the other quite exactly the same way. So. And when you said about misconceptions, I totally agree that people think that we actually make the visual effects shots, the finals. And I try to tell people, it's like, there's not enough hours in a day for me <laughs> to actually do the finished product especially when I've got 2,300 shots. But, um, you know, I'm barely able to meet some of the expectations that people put into the schedules. Um, and, you know, that's probably the, the one thing that I would just wish that people would give us time to, to do our, our job so that we're not putting out fires, but we're actually able to, you know, do things and um, that help the visual effects people moving forward on a shot, things like that. So. So Marty, how about you? What was the film project show that um, really you felt propelled you forward in terms of skill set or just advanced your career? 
when I got out of film school, the last thing I wanted to do was be an editorial. The absolute <laughs> last thing I wanted to do. I hired somebody to cut my thesis film. I just don't want to have anything to do with it. And um, I kind of fell into it by accident. I moved back to Minnesota and Prince started shooting um, Graffiti Bridge. And I tried to get a job on the set. I couldn't get a job. The editor who I hired to cut my thesis film said, just come be my intern in the cutting room and I'll take money off of what I'm going to charge you to cut your film. Long story short, I became a union assistant editor. And when I started getting that paycheck, I thought, all right, I could do this for a while. <laughs> this is okay. But um, there have been shows along the way. You know, there was a show that's not one of my proudest shows, but I had a lot of fun on the show. And um, I did so much comping that the director actually told the, the VFX supervisor, we shouldn't be paying the vendor for blocking because he's doing it all. <laughs> um, because, you know, I got from the vendor, I got these perfect, they shot the movie exactly like the previs. So I got the previs plates with blue screen and it was such a joy to put those into the actual plates and it looked, it looked great, but you know, it changes from movie to movie, who you work with. Of course, working with JJ has been amazing because he's so into the visual effects stuff. And, you know, he's always really appreciative with anything you try to do, whether it ends up working or not working. But I'd have to say when I got moved up to visual effects editor from being an assistant and when I started doing that job or doing this job and realized this is everything I like to do. I, I don't know if um, Sharon and Witten find this interesting, but you know, it's being a visual effects editor is a combination of being creative and doing comps. But the other side of it is, you know, tracking and keeping, you know, keeping track of 2,300 shots or however many there are is it's not easy to do. Oh, I absolutely agree. And it's, so it's, it's weird combination of skills. You know, you, you, you gotta be creative. But you also you have to be technical also. you got to use both sides of your brain. Yeah, I totally agree. And I agree with what you said about um, not really wanting to be an editor. You know, I, but once I did visual effects editing on my first job, it was like, this is it. I love this. I love going through and doing counts and checking the cut against the counts that I turned over. And all that stuff that most people don't like to do in visual effects editing, I... I, I love that minutia of it. I have to say that the comp thing for me, comping, it, it feels a little, I mean, I, I feel a little bit like uh, stage fright on it. Like, um, I, I like doing it if there's no expectations, but if there is expectations, I get a little like stage fright that like, oh gosh, is this gonna be good enough? And I actually had one editor be like, it's, it's fine. Stop working on it. You know, you know, it doesn't need to be that good. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> see, then you, you and I need to work together <laughs> so you can do all of that tracking stuff. Okay. <laughs> and I'll do the comps. I but love it, that. I, another thing about the comps that I don't think we really talked about that I think is becoming a thing in our business is I, I, I think Sharon feels the same way is I don't like to go outside the avid to do a comp. I mean, I use, Photoshop to make elements sometimes to use in a comp with the Avid effects, but 98% of the comps I do are using those Avid effects. Yes. My feeling is if I have to go outside the Avid, it's no longer my job anymore. I agree. That's the job of the vendor. Yes. And, and I think what's happening, and maybe it has to happen more in TV than it actually does in features, but you've got younger people coming in saying, well, I can finish that wire removal in the cutting room and they're doing it for the mm -hmm. same salary. And it's not, they're not doing themselves, you know, any favors. Yes. Because now mm -hmm. producers are going to expect that they're going to expect a visual effects editor to, to do, you know, to comp with whatever necessary tools they need. And then if they can finish them, go ahead and finish them. Right. And they don't mm -hmm. give you more time in the schedule to do your other work. I think that's why like just defining what a visual effects editor is is so important so that some of those things that if somebody's able to do it that's fine it's extra but it shouldn't be um expected right you know it should be on yeah. the, um, it should be on the side totally on the yeah. side and i know of vfx editors who have done that you know it's a it's a separate thing like okay i'll finish that shot at home yeah, yeah hire them separately mm -hmm. 
Sharon, mm -hmm. that's why we need this visual effects editor's classification. I know, right? That, wouldn't we're that be good? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> that's what we're here to do today. Um, I know that we're well into overtime, but there's this one last question. If I don't ask, um, it'd be a mistake. And that's, it's so prescient in that this, the situation that we're currently in um, with the pandemic and everyone having to work from home, clearly challenging for everybody, but not exactly the same experience for everybody. The three of you work in a medium where, you know, you are able to work remotely just more naturally, I think. And so what I wanted to get was your take on how this remote post-production situation um, will affect your roles moving forward. What, what changes do you see possibly being permanent and and how are you best suited to sort of taking on this new remote post-production situation? Well, when um, they came to us and they said that, you know, we got you two weeks and then we're probably going to have to close down the cutting room and you need to turn over everything in two weeks. And I looked at them like, what? <laughs> you think I'm going to turn over the whole show in two weeks? Um, I, and they, they paid everybody and we ended up being, we worked for a week and then we were laid off for a week. So they paid everybody a week, but I had said, I wanted to make sure that the visual effects people could keep working. So um, I actually worked that week and continued to work from home. And we just gave me everything on a hard drive. And that way I was able to still turn over shots and get shots from visual effects and um, answer questions about um, the scope of work or what plates were available. But what I find, and, and several editors I've talked to, is that working from home, they sort of think you're on 24-7. And um, so when the crew did come back, go back to the cutting room at the end of April, um, I would, we would have a shuttle drive and the PA would come in and pick up the shuttle drive early in the morning. But meanwhile, I wasn't getting shots till like 10.30 at night that I needed to download, cut in, and get uh, on the drive so that they could have it for the DI or the stage. Um, but I mean, we were in a, a situation where they accelerated our schedule. Um, but I do think that knowing it, uh, as a board member that our guild uh, wasn't hurt as bad as the cinematographers and all those that work in production were, you know, 100% of their members were just unemployed. We had people working and it seems like more of our members were working through June and some were going to start back up again in July, maybe working from home. Um, but we are really lucky that we can, you know, with a good internet connection and a firewall or with a hard drive, continue to work as a team. It's, it's difficult, but we can do that more mm -hmm. than other guilds can. Um, and even in different states, because I know someone that's working on a really large, huge crew film, and he went back home to see his dad, and he, you know, so he's able to work from back east. And, you know, they're shooting in another country. And so um, this remote thing, a lot of people are like, we love working from home. But, you know, the Editor's Guild is like, okay, but you need to be compensated. If you're using your own equipment, you need to be compensated for any electricity. So, I mean, those are all things that if we start doing this on a regular basis, you know, we as members need to come up with what we think is fair. But I hope we don't. I hope we don't do this on a regular basis. I mean, it's been nice that we could continue to work, but this is not the ideal situation, I don't think. It's not as collaborative as it would be if we were all in the same place. Again, it's great that we can do it, but there are several complications with it. You know, everybody having their own media is basically right now the only way it works, the only way it works well. Um, you know, trying to keep the media the same on everybody's avid wherever they are. I agree with you. I would rather be in a cutting room with everybody else and see people. It, I mean, it's... This time has been great, and it's been great that I can work and I can, you know, ha I have my family around. That that has, you know, been wonderful. But it's I, you feel sometimes you feel alone. I have an assistant on this film, and um, we've done so much FaceTime audio. You wouldn't believe when we have turn shots over, we do it together. Um, when we revise the cut, we're doing it together. Um, but it wouldn't, it'd be a lot easier if he was standing here next to me. Mm -hmm. um, for more reasons than one, you know, just the camaraderie. I think we all miss that. Yeah. Um, 
But thanks to the three of you, I, I got a little little camaraderie boost today and a, and a little bit of an education. So thank you all very much for uh, dropping some science on visual effects editing. It's not as mysterious as everyone thinks. They all no, no. <laughs> Wait, don't tell them that. Don't, don't tell, tell them that. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too late. The secret's out. VFX editing isn't that mysterious. Well, maybe it still is a little. But it sounds like a lot of fun and maybe a career you would be into if you weren't already. Please join me in thanking Marty, Sharon, and Witten for carving out some time to talk to us today. Like I said, it was long overdue for me. If you would like to pursue a career in visual effects editing, or certainly editing in general, a great way to start is to learn that crazy Avid thing you heard our guests talk about. And you can start that journey for free using Avid Media Composer first. It's powerful, it's portable. I guess if you run on a laptop, it's portable, but like I said, it's free. So follow the link in today's podcast show notes to where you can download Avid Media Composer first for your very own. That'll do it for today. This podcast is over. But just for now, we will meet again next week to talk about post-production with the pros behind your favorite shows. Oh, that rhymed. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you once again for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>